I want to look at President-elect Joe Biden's choice of Brian Dees, the former advisor to Barack Obama, to be the director of the National Economic Council. Dees was not present on the stage Tuesday when Biden announced his economic nominees after leaving the White House. He became global head of sustainable investing at the investment giant BlackRock. This is Dees speaking to Krishan Manpour earlier this year about BlackRock's climate plan. The most important thing to identify is not necessarily are you going to divest from entire sectors or segments, but instead, where are those companies and where are those business models that are the most prepared for this transition? And so we spend a lot of time asking the question, not necessarily are you going to exit the entire oil and gas industry or all utilities globally, but instead, within those sectors, which are the companies that are the most prepared, that are investing the most in the clean technologies of the future, and which of those companies are less prepared? Deputy Treasury Secretary nominee Wally Adeyemo also has ties to BlackRock. He's the former chief of staff to BlackRock's chief executive, Larry Fink. Uh, in addition to Brianna Joy Gray, I want to bring in Kate Aronoff. Um, she is a staff writer at The New Republic. Her latest piece, just out, The Problem with Putting a BlackRock Alum in Charge of Greening the Economy. It follows up on her story in June that asked, is BlackRock the new vampire squid? She's the co-author of A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal. Kate, um, if you can talk about the choice of Brian Deese. Sure. Thanks for having me. Uh, so, Brian Deese has, has spent a lot of time in Washington and has spent a lot of time at BlackRock, right? So, a lot of the sort of talk about Brian Deese's nomination in the last couple of days, since sort of rumors came out about him being appointed to NEC, uh, has focused on that he's a good person, um, that he spent time in the Obama administration working on things like the Paris Agreement and conservation work. And I, you know, I think like many of the progressives who have who have put a put a real uh, question to about. Brian Deese's record out there, um, don't necessarily think that's enough, right, uh, for someone to serve on one of the most important economic bodies in the in the world, right? So BlackRock has has very smartly cultivated its its reputation as a sort of good guy on Wall Street, right? They're not an investment bank. They just handle the money of retirees or an asset manager, um, and they have very you know cannily uh, cultivated this, this reputation and an enormous amount of unaccountable power. Time after time, they have sought to shirk regulation, uh, and in the last year especially, and while Brian Deese has been there really greenwash their image. So put out this, this sort of idea that, that BlackRock is taking the climate crisis seriously, all the while continuing to invest in, uh, in fossil fuels at an enormous rate. So, you know, I think that it's, it doesn't necessarily matter so much whether, whether Brian Deese is, is personally a good person. You know, he may well be, right? I don't know. I don't know Brian Deese personally. Um, and, but, but I think it deserves looking at both BlackRock's ambitions, the kind of power they're trying to amass in government, uh, both here and in the European Union, which maybe we can talk about, uh, and, and also Brian Deese's own record, which is not sterling, right? Like I said, he's worked uh, more on climate issues for BlackRock now than he ever did for the Obama administration, and was, by all accounts, just a very uh, stalwart defender of business as usual in, in the Obama administration. We've seen nothing really to suggest that he has changed, right? That he doesn't support all of the above, what he, what he did in the Obama administration, really going to bat for Arctic drilling, um, ex you know, praising uh, the fact that oil production had, had been expanded under Obama's tenure. Um, so I think there's just not enough evidence out there to, to think that Brian Deese's own personal character can overcome the sort of danger of putting one of the largest companies in the world uh, in charge of a very, very important economic body in the U.S. Well, Kate, specifically to that point of one of the, the largest uh, uh, financial companies in the world, most people are not familiar with BlackRock. They certainly are familiar with Citigroup or Goldman Sachs or Chase. Could you talk a little bit about the extent of BlackRock's uh, financial prowess around the world. Uh, and, and also, if you could uh, comment about the choice of uh, John Kerry as a climate envoy by, uh, by Joe Biden. 
Sure. So to talk about BlackRock a little bit, they control $7 trillion worth of assets. Uh, and that has grown enormously in, in the last 10 years. So uh, prior to the Great Recession, when interest rates were a bit higher, uh, sort of big institutional investor, investors like pension funds would put their money into sort of safe assets like treasury bonds, which offer uh, reliable returns, right? And so as interest rates have gone down, as a response to uh, the, the crisis of the, of the financial crisis, uh, that has become a less attractive option. And so you have these big institutional investors who are seeking uh, reliable returns, right? And so the products that BlackRock offers, like other asset managers, have become very attractive. Uh, and, and particularly these passive passive funds, which are managed by algorithms, and which notably are not subject to the sort of sustainability screens that um, Brian Deese has spent you know, his, his last four years at BlackRock uh, talking about. So uh, these are enormously powerful um, uh, sort of bodies, uh, the institutional investors generally, um, sorry, uh, these big asset master, these big asset managers generally um, have have become sort of you know bigger than than anyone would have imagined. And BlackRock in particular is a sort of monopoly provider of risk management software through this thing called Aladdin um, to central banks around the world. Uh, people may also know that they manage the debt buying programs that the Fed has run, um, both in the in the last financial crisis and in uh, the most recent recession. And so they have really tried to just uh, accumulate an enormous amount of power uh, and, and by all accounts are, are very much striving to be a fourth branch of government, uh, which has included hiring uh, Obama era alumni uh, to, you know, create a sort of positive reputation among Democrats, especially, uh, and with the full knowledge that these people might get hired back, which, you know, has, has worn out in picks for um, Biden's pick for Treasury and for the National Economic Council. Um, so I think there are just a lot of questions that I, I, I have been sort of concerned to see folks in the climate world coming to Brian Deese's defense without really thinking about what the, what the problem with putting BlackRock in the National Economic Council means and, and just Briefly on this, I mean, we've seen this before, right? We've seen what putting allies of Wall Street into important economic posts has meant, not just for the country, right? Not just in um, putting forth a, a, a much too small stimulus like Larry Summers pushed for uh, in, in 2008 uh, when he was head of incoming head of the National Economic Council, um, but, you know, electorally, right? Democrats lost in a blowout in, in 2010 and continued to lose every branch of government um, because they pursued austerity. They pursued the sort of fiscal discipline that Brian Deese himself preached when, when he was uh, the deputy and then acting director of the Office of Management and Budget. So this is a dangerous strategy, just sort of self-evidently in Democrats' own self-interest, right? So, you know, that's, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about John Kerry uh, now. So he was directed or appointed to head um, this new climate envoy on the National Security Council. I think a lot of climate activists can rightly see this as a win, that there is a cabinet level post for climate, right? That is, is nothing to, to, to sort of um, take for granted. It's a huge, a huge step forward in terms of uh, how seriously this administration is at least uh, claiming to take the climate crisis. But again, I think there's a lot of questions remaining about whether John Kerry has changed his views since the Obama administration, where he was a very vocal defender of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, which would have opened up the U.S. to challenges from investor state dispute settlements that allow uh, corporations to sue governments for things like environmental and climate protections. Um, he has you know, consistently preached that uh, climate change is primarily a national security threat, which I think combined with the position of, of his envoy post and the rest of Biden's foreign policy team who are by all accounts really, ha really hawks uh, on, on foreign policy, I think, you know, sets up maybe seeing this crisis not as a um, threat to humanity, but as a threat to, you know, U.S. military assets, right, which I think is a, is a sort of dangerous way to, to view this, this problem. Can you also comment on Cedric Richmond, uh, the Louisiana Congress member, uh, former Congressional Black Caucus chair, uh, that Biden has named to lead the White House Office on Public Engagement? Uh, the Sunrise Movement uh, called the move a betrayal, adding Richmond has, quote, taken more donations from the fossil fuel industry during his congressional career than nearly any other Democrat, cozied up to big oil and gas, stayed silent and ignored meeting with organizations in his own community while they suffered 
suffered from toxic pollution and sea level rise. If you can talk about BlackRock, um, as well as the S Cedric Richmond appointment, and the whole issue of who is making up this cabinet. Uh, what does this say to the progressive wing of the Democratic Party that feels that they threw in their lot wholeheartedly and pushed hard to uh, for the Biden-Harris ticket, uh, and are wondering what kind of sway they have at this point? Yeah, I, I think you know, the, the statement from Sunrise about Cedric Richmond is, is pretty spot on, I would say. Um, so he represents, you know, a, a part of the country known as Cancer Alley uh, in, in Louisiana, which has just been inundated by pollution from chemicals companies and, and the petrochemicals industry and, and oil companies, uh, and has routinely just ignored concerns from his constituents about the fact that, you know, many, many of their neighbors are coming down with cancer that they didn't need to have uh, because these companies are um, not being held accountable for, for polluting these communities. And so uh, I think it's a real—it's uh, a real thumb in the nose to the folks who work to elect Joe Biden, right? Young people made a lot of phone calls for Joe Biden. They knocked doors for Joe Biden. Um, progressives, you know, in, in places like uh, Ilhan Omar's district and Rashida Tlaib's district, um, really, you know, fought to, to deliver him key states. And with appointments like Brian Dees and like, and like Senator Richman, you know, he, they're not getting anything for their, for their, for their buck, right? I mean, they really uh, went to bat for a candidate who was not their choice, um, who was not the person they wanted to see in the White House, um, and yet knew the stakes of this election, knew that it was important to, to have a Democrat and get Donald Trump out of office. Um, and they're just not really uh, they're not really seeing any any get from from the Biden administration. I think that's disappointing, you know, for, for the fact that we have a giant climate crisis, which I am personally not so confident that Biden's um, pick so far will take on in, 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 in the scale that that crisis desires. Um, but also that, you know, why would you so actively try to turn off what is going to be the biggest part of the Democratic base in, 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 the, in the coming years, right? If you look back to the history of the Democratic Party, when was the party winning big majorities? When was it, you know, controlling, the, controlling Congress for decades on end? Uh, it was after the New Deal, when it delivered for people, when it, when it built, you know, new coalitions, when it sought to actually expand its base. Um, certainly not when it, when it tried to target um, you know, tiny, tiny slivers of suburban white women uh, to, to win them over with the most sort of poll-tested talking points they could find, right? I think there's a lot of uh, just a big lack of self-reflection from people who have, you know, been doing politics the same way for 20 years at a time when the Democratic Party has really faced a crisis in terms of who, who its, its base is moving forward. Uh, and so I think it's, it's concerning for all those reasons. And, you know, I would like Democrats to control the Senate if they don't win these runoff elections. I would like strong Democratic majorities to push through climate action. And I'm just not sure that that is really the goal that, that Joe Biden is chasing. Hello. Uh, uh, Kate, if I if I can, I just wanted to ask Brianna in the few seconds we have left. Uh, Brianna, can you uh, give us a sense whether you believe that there's still a role for Bernie Sanders in a Biden administration? Or influence. Brianna, Sanders. could you start again? Yeah, it's difficult to say that even if there were a role, uh, that Bernie Sanders could have any significant influence given the overwhelming um, gestalt of the pick so far. And what Joe Biden has very firmly committed to throughout his campaign, which is that nothing will fundamentally change. And it's not clear to me that Bernie will have more leverage or influence within Biden's administration than he would as a relative outsider in, in the Senate. Um, moreover, uh, it seems by the, you know, every indication is that Joe Biden doesn't have any interest in um, giving anything over to the left, offering anything um, to the left. You see uh, olive branches being extended to Republicans, Cindy McCain. Um, you know, we all saw the extent to which Republicans were given a platform at the at the national convention, and I think that that's a trend we should expect to continue. That this isn't an, an administration that's particularly interested in offering much to the base of the Democratic Party.
We want to thank you both for being with us. Of course, these conversations will continue. Brianna Joy Gray, former National Press Secretary for Bernie Sanders 2020, co-host of Bad Faith Podcast and contributing editor to Current Affairs. And thanks to Kate Aronoff, staff writer at The New Republic, co-author of A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal. We'll link to your latest piece in The New Republic. When we come back, the Dead Are Arising, The Life of Malcolm X. We'll look at the new National Book Award-winning biography. Stay with us.